begin. For those of you who come on Tuesday nights, you should have recognized Lawrence to read the second reading. That was the reading that the speaker actually made his presentation on. Why is God not fair? Ultimately, God is never fair because God wants sinners. He shouldn't, but he does. Just think about what we heard the other night. Second thing I bring to your attention is I hope I'm going to make some, convey to you some of the passion and the love I have of the encounter I just read. I've heard so many poor sermons on this. I've heard so many times people have taken things and put it into an American context and forget the world in which Jesus lived, the world that John writes about. In case you don't get it, if you heard the first week, if you heard the song, if you heard the gospel, you should have heard about water. You should have heard about thirsting. Okay? Anytime Christians got together and they reflected on these readings, when you hear water and when you hear thirst, in the background, like the music of a movie, it's thinking about baptism. This is, an, this is a baptismal passage, and it's about that which uh, Georgia and are on their journey. And by the way, Georgia, thanks so much for the beautiful reading of your work. So let me put this in context. It's about faith, it's about thirst, it's about water. Centuries and centuries ago, a very perfect people who had just accomplished their freedom, they escaped from the land of Egypt. And they get to the desert, they find out something. The desert is hot and dry and there's no water there. And they start making demands of their liberator. And they say to Moses, look, you've got to give us something to drink. If you don't, we will die. And by the way, God, you've got to give us something to drink. Because if you don't quench our thirst, all everyone's going to remember is that you brought us out here in the desert to kill us. To which God has to say, you're welcome. Centuries later, a king who was quite imperfect would write a song one of the psalms of the, of the, of the scriptures, the psalm that we praise, the psalm between the readings. And he goes back to that incident in the desert, and he said to the, he reminds people of his music, we can't be like our ancestors, we can't harden our hearts, we can't threaten God just because we don't get what we want. We have to thirst for it. And then there was this very incredibly perfect and beautiful woman whose name we do not know. A woman who's a half-breed, she's a, a member of the race of Samaritans, they are part Jewish, part descendants of the Syrian conquerors. She has an encounter with a wanderer at a public well. It's the middle of the day, and nobody in their right mind goes out to draw water in the middle of the day. It's hot. Okay, Ned goes an Englishman, you know? She's hot, and she's tired, and her life has been trash. And she has this incredible encounter. Now, I've heard so many sermons at this point go off on a tangent. And they make the fact that they start analyzing her five marriages and what a loser she is. Okay? And of course, they're playing her love against Christ. Well, she may be a loser, but not for the reasons you're thinking. Go back to that culture, go back to the people. Women, and I don't know if women answer. Did you have the, did you have the authority to get married? Did you choose your spouse and marry? Him? Are any of you women awake? <laughs> Are any of you women awake? No. Nice and loud. No. no. You had no rights. Okay? If she had been married five times, the only scenarios that could have played out is this. Okay? Either at some point, some of them she may have been widowed from. Or she was divorced. She was jettisoned. She was dumped. Maybe they didn't like her because her personality was abrasive. You kind of get a little hint of that. Okay, she's a little sarcastic. Maybe they didn't like her because they blamed her for being childless. We don't know why. But if she ends up being married five times, it's because she was thrown back to the man who owns her, which is your father, unless the father has passed. And if she's living with someone now, it's because for her own survival, the only way she could survive was to bargain with the only weapon she thought she had left, which is her sexuality. Tired, she is sad, she is angry, she is not to be messed with. She is thirsting for water, but she's thirsting for so much more. She is thirsting for self-respect, she is thirsting for a kind word. She's at the well by herself, which in English she shunned. 
Nobody would be with her. That's why she's going there in the middle of the day. So she wouldn't run into anyone. Why would you want to associate with people who are going to turn their backs on you? And in this encounter, Jesus simply talks to her. And he's going to quench her thirst for more than just water. He's going to quench her thirst for meaning and for God. And like I said, when Christians ever told the story, immediately when they talk about this woman and her conversation with Jesus, it's always about the journey to baptism. Water's in the background. It's always about baptism. And it's kind of obvious with the water, but listen to the dialogue. Listen to what's going on, and you're following the journey. As she comes to understand who Jesus is and what this can mean for her life. I told you, she's like us in so many ways. She bears all of the smells and the sweats of life with all of its ups and downs. She may have known love or not. She certainly loves rejection. I wonder if she's ever known God. So she starts a journey. She starts a dialogue with this fellow, and she kind of looks at him with a smirk, as you can hear in her voice, there's a lot of hostility. It starts off almost like Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. You know, you're talking to me? For those of you who are old enough to remember that movie. And then the others ask me now. Right? And from that initial encounter, there is then curiosity and a little skepticism, like a stupid male. How are you going to give me any water? You don't even got a bucket. And yet it starts to grow. Jesus probes. He sets her up. He asks her a very honest question, a very respectful question. I'll do for you, but since being a woman, you have to have your husband's permission for everything, go get your husband. And that sets up her interesting response. And then immediately to deflect the issues of what's going on in her private life, what does she do? She starts theological conversation. Other than talking about her marriages and her failures or whatever has happened to her, what she does is start talking about where should we worship God? What, what do we do? Why do you people differ from us? A long time ago, I had a spiritual director, I think it was in college at the time, he gave a talk, and he warned us who were about to enter seminary. He says, remember, the evil one uses theology to basically deflect people from God because it is so easy to talk about God rather than talk to God. Okay? Theology is wonderful, but if it's nothing more than an excuse not to pray, then what's the point? <clears throat> so she wants to talk about God. Jesus won't let her. He stays with her. He loves her. He calls her to repentance. And ultimately, because of their conversation, she goes back and she starts spreading the word. By definition, she is the first of Apostle who actually lives up to the mission of what an apostle should be. To be an apostle is to be sent, and Jesus sends her, and she spreads the word on her own. We don't even know her name. It's about faith, it's about commitment, it's about love. He knows her for what she is, he calls her to something greater, he offers her love and forgiveness, and she is us. He knows us for who we are. He calls us to something greater. He offers us love and forgiveness. All we have to do is listen with the ears of our mind and our heart and to realize He is calling us. In the background is the music of baptism. Baptism is the moment where we were washed and marked and we belong to Christ forever. In a couple of weeks, on the night before Easter, Georgia and Riley and Matt will be washed and marked and will be known by Christ forever. Call to him, as happened to each of us on the day we were baptized. And baptism is that one moment in our lives which should not live for the present, but live for the future. It's the moment of our lives where we focus not on just what's happening then, but what I do with my life for the rest of my life as a disciple, as a follower, as a learner. What we ask, what the Lord asks of us, do the will of his Father, just as he did. Acknowledge him as Lord, priority in our lives, as he has with her. Baptism is truly being born again. Three in this community will be born again in a couple of weeks. All of us were born again on the day we were baptized. How do we live it? Are our ears open? The same Lord that called this woman is the same Lord that calls each on that journey. The journey still remains a struggle. The journey is filled with imperfect 
people, but know this, that Christ walks with you. He accompanies you. He calls us to renewal. And as your heart is open, and your mind is not closed, he will never walk away. <coughs> there was a well in a town of Sikar. A woman whose name you don't even know walks to the water and her thirst for life and meaning and God is quenched. There's a community here. You were washed in the waters of baptism. 